Hello, welcome to Jewish Museum Milwaukee's Museum Moments. Um, this is kind of an auspicious day. This is our 100th museum moment, which is crazy to me that a year ago tomorrow, we sat down and started this process of figuring out how to communicate to an audience that wasn't coming into a museum. And a year later, lots of things have changed and lots of things haven't. Um, you can come into the museum. We're open. We'd love for you to come in. But we've discovered this is a great way to connect on so many stories and to broaden our audiences and to expand the way we tell our stories. So in as much as we're open to the public, we continue to do these. And each one of them gives us a new and different way to explore things we have in our collections. Today, we're going on a journey to explore a brief history of political cartoons, which this is an undertaking I assigned one of my fabulous interns, Emma Gasinski Rose. She started this process and came back to me a week later and was like, because we started just with cartoons. And then all of a sudden we were like, wait, that's way too big. And we know we could go in the direction of comic books and Stan Lee and Superman and all of those areas. We could go in the direction of comic strips. And we had to narrow and narrow and keep narrowing until we got to this moment of political cartoons, which we feel is very much connected with our current special exhibit, To Paint is to Live. This is an image that the artist that works at the center of our exhibit, Eric Lichtbell, Leslie created of himself. It's a self-portrait. You can see three of his identities on display here. First, he registers himself as a builder in Theresienstadt. That's his occupation. So you can see the house painting brush that he's using there. But behind his back, he's hiding his own fine art, his artistry, um, and that that's kind of a part that he's keeping hidden into himself. And on the last identity is that 597 there. That's the identity that was assigned to him by the Nazis on his transport to Theresienstadt. So each one of those gives you that sense of how Eric Lichtlaleskli sees himself, how others see him, and how he's portraying himself. So let's dig in a little on this idea of political cartoons. Political cartoons can be lots of different things and come in lots of different flavors. And this is a particularly interesting exhibit because it's not an area in which we normally see cartoons coming from the inside. And yet there is a whole body of political cartoons that were created by people in ghettos um, and camps, exploring the experience of those people in those camps. Eric Lickbell Leslie is part of that uh, tradition. And my colleague, Samantha Goldberg at the Holocaust Education Resource Center has created a phenomenal uh, curriculum that deals with this uh, particular content. But some things to note as you're looking at political cartoons is that there are things that consciously attempt to visually exaggerate, emphasize, or distort the nature of an event um, or person in order to motivate the viewer to contemplate an issue. And it can be done through visual exaggeration, transposition, transformation, or contradiction. And in this piece here called Terezinka, you can see this exaggerated staircase that this guy is running down in order to get to the restroom because he, like so many people there, has a, um, has a, uh, bowel movement disease. He has dysentery or something. It's like paratyphoid, which is causing him to have incredible diarrhea. And this is how Leskley is depicting this. You can see that through the exaggerated um, movement, through the, 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 the signals above his head. There's so much going on in this piece. And he's giving this sense of movement and flow and anxiety through those, really those stairs become the linchpin and understanding of, you know, when you really have to go to the bathroom and you just don't seem to ever come to the end of that stairs, the end of that ride. So there's a, a way of providing context there too. Um, and so this is what Les Leslie is exploring in his art, but he's part of a broader, long tradition. And political cartoons didn't just start, you know, in the 20th century, that this is a long-standing tradition, pretty much going back to when the printing press starts rising. In the United States, one of the first political cartoonists is actually Ben Franklin. This is one of his join or die. You can see um, he's got all of these different colonies, New England, New York, New Jersey.
So now you can see me again. I'm back again. Yes, I don't know what happened, but thank you guys for being patient and standing, staying. Uh, so, so I was say, so as I was saying, I was exploring Thomas Nast and Benjamin Franklin, both of whom had uh, early had were early political cartoonists. I'm back, Robin. I'm here, um, and they uh, created these these interesting pieces. Nast is famous for creating not just Uncle Sam, but also the symbol of the Republican elephant and the Democratic donkey that still are part of our kind of popular iconography and used in political cartoons today. I'm gonna go back and share my screen again. And we'll keep going from there. So. Jews pick up on this tradition. And in fact, uh, this uh, academic Helena Frankel Schlamm writes in an article called Contemporary Scribes, Jewish American Cartoonists. At every point in the history of cartoon arts in America, some Jewish cartoonists were able to contribute their talents and ability to in innovate. They brought the sharpened perspective and the moral anxiety of the outsider to this artistic expression, and they have strongly influenced the cartoon arts. The cartoonist at his or her drawing board brings to mind the image of the scribe, an old and revered profession in Judaism. Jewish cartoon. And you lost me again. I'm going to maybe have to add my slideshow afterwards because clearly there's something going on where I'm talking through my slideshow and it's disappearing as we go. So I will add this up and I will reframe it and, and film it. But just so you guys know, in thinking about um, these visuals, you get this sense of outsiders as insiders, you know, that they are people who are providing commentary. And some of the most famous names in cartooning in the 20th century are Jews. Uh, you've got a guy named Walter Gropper, you've got uh, Will Eisner, you've got Art Spiegelman, um, and probably the most well-known of these um, artists is a guy named Herbert Block. And that name is actually maybe less familiar because he goes by the, the name Herblock. And her block becomes uh, this kind of big sensation, um, but starts out actually as very much a contemporary of Eric Lisboa Leslie. He was born in 1909, and Leslie was born in 1911. You know, so I'm not they, they're they're contemporaneous. Both grow up in this sense of of cultivating their artistry, um, and by the time her block is 20. He is working for the Chicago Tribune as their political cartoonist. His first cartoon appears in April of 1929, and his career spans until 2000. So if you think about all of the world events that Herblock is getting to, uh, it's pretty much everything in the, the 20th century after World War I. He gets um, the 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 stock market crash, the Great Depression. Um, he sees the rise of Hitler and in fact is very critical of American anti-interventionism, that he says we need to be involved and does a number of cartoons that explore that issue in particular. In 1943, he is drafted into the army and serves in the information area where he's writing and working um, in that part of the army. And after the war, he goes to work for um, the Washington Post. And this becomes a, an incredibly fertile time in his career. And it's interesting because the Post gives him a fair amount of uh, editorial control. So even if there are times, for instance, when he is very anti-Vietnam uh, War and the Post had not yet come to the Pentagon Papers and all of these things, that he has a very different um, opinion than that the rest of the editorial page. Catherine Graham says of him, the extraordinary quality of Herb's eye, his in insight and comments immediately stood out. When the Post was struggling for its existence, Herb was one of its major assets, as he has been throughout his 50 years here. Um, the Post and Herb Lock are forever intertwined. If the Post is his forum, he helped create it, and he has been its shining light. So Catherine Graham was the longtime uh, pu publisher of the, um, of the Washington Post, and she understands the impact and import of 
her block in, in both being part of the post and being a uh, an ambassador of the post. His office, and this was kind of unusual for the time, was actually in the newsroom. So he felt that that was an incredible advantage because he would see all of the news as it was coming in uh, and would be able to, to utilize his coworkers to understand these kind of broad global events. He came in every day at 5.30 in the morning with five different uh, cartoons set up for the day. And they were generally slightly different takes on the same issue that he would work with his editor to figure out which was the right one. But imagine that each time he's coming at an issue, he's exploring it in five different lenses in order to find that visual that is truly the picture that's worth a thousand words. And I think that's what we value in our political cartoons, this way of synthesizing and condensing complex issues and bringing them out in a unique and interesting way. This is all by way of saying that this is just scratching the surface of an incredibly complex issue. Something that, you know, I think one of the things we do with Museum Moments is this ability to start a conversation and hopefully reel you in and get you to want to learn more. So next week, we have a discussion with um, Phil Hans, who is the political cartoonist for um, the Wisconsin uh, State Journal in Madison. And he is going to be exploring kind of a broader sense of political cartooning and then speaking very specifically to the images and icons that Eric Lichbow Leslie says. If you'd like to join us, you should. Oh, my family is coming in with a sign they made me. Isn't this great? It says, happy 100, yay JMMM. Woo, I think I should put this up behind my, my myself. Oh, and I, I'm getting something bubbly to drink. Everybody do a toast. Toast. I'm glad we got on there. Um, so cheers, cheers to all of you. Thank you very much to my great supporter, Robin Cohen, who is always looking for ways to make this better and, and has been such a, a tremendous help throughout this period. And thank you to my colleagues who've also stood up and said, hey, we can take on this, this, and this. Thank you to Emma Gisinski rose And guess what? Next week, we'll be back again um, and we appreciate all that you've done to make museum moments happen. Woo! <laughs>